Okay, good evening. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second talk of the World Affairs series, The World in 2050. Uh, I, I see some familiar faces here. So you obviously enjoyed the first talk, which was Hamish McRae talking about the world in 2050 as a whole. Uh, I'm pleased to say that all of the uh, uh, lectures and talks will be available on the BLSI YouTube channel uh, in about four weeks time. So you can always refresh your memories. Um, but before we start, I've got a bit of admin to go through before I introduce Barrett, our speaker tonight. So please bear with me for a couple of minutes. As I mentioned once before, for you in the audience, I think if, if you have come in just a, a few minutes ago, we're gonna do a poll at the beginning of the presentation. So if you want to take part, just scan that QR code or go to slido.com and put in 1601192. Don't do anything else. You, I will just ask a question and the question will then come up on your phone uh, automatically. So hopefully that will work. Otherwise we'll have to have a show of hands in the room instead. And uh, so please, if you want to take part in the in the uh, in the poll, please uh, do that now. Whilst I do the admin bit, so there's two bits of admin: one for the audience in the room, and that is in all my time here at the BLSI, which is too many years I care to remember. Uh, we never had a fire alarm go off, and I don't intend this to be the one night where it does. But should it do, then I would like you to leave the building in an orderly fashion from the stairs you came from, go out of the front door, turn right, and at the end of the road, turn right again and assemble on uh, Chapel Green. And then we can take your names and make sure that everybody's been safely out of the building. So that's really all the admin for, you, for those of you in the room. As far as the online audience is concerned, there are basically just three ways of asking questions. The first way of asking questions, and that is at the Q&A stage, not before, please. Uh, you can unmute yourself and show your video after Barrett has finished his presentation. And we've done the second, uh, second poll. And you can ask a question directly to the rest of the audience here as well on our big screen. The second way of doing it is to raise your hand electronically on Zoom. And then I shall pick you out and you can ask your question. And the third way, of asking a question is the most fun way, I suppose, is actually starting to put your questions and observations in the chat room, because that becomes quite dynamic. People also feed off each other and all of a sudden we've got uh, various issues being discussed online. And again, we can use that for the, for the Q and A session. So um, I'm going to do the slide, the, the poll now first, and then I introduce Barrett and hand over to him uh, for his presentation. So fingers on your buttons, please, for those of you who want to participate. Oops. Okay, standards of living will be higher and we will all be better off in 2050. Agree or disagree? <laughs> Uh, waiting for a few more. Still going. Give it a couple more minutes. Yes, well, we're obviously living in the world of polarization, of binary opposites. It seems to be too close to call. So I think I think there is a marginal agreement that we may be better off. Okay, I'll ask you the next question. Oh, 50-50, look, there you go. That wasn't me, honestly. Will the UK be more or less important to the global economy in 2050? More or less? Less. Come on. I can't vote on this. There must be someone. There must be someone who... No, wow, okay. Interesting. Well, and if that's the case, sorry, you're waving. That's just you, but it may be more than one. You want, has anybody says more important? 5%. So there must be more than two of you then, by definition. So that's good. Okay, so less is, is the agreed uh, position. 
And then finally, which one, and I just want you to, because all of these could be true, but which one statement best summarizes how you feel about the global economy in 2050? The rich will be richer, China will dominate the world, there will be no more poverty, Western countries will remain econ economically dominant. Interesting. Okay. I, but that's, that's quite a sobering thought. So poverty is still going to be with us. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the saddest elements of this. this. Uh, and then uh, I think the rich will be richer is, is obviously way ahead. And then we've got China seeing as the, the new superpower, probably, well, we'll probably will be the largest economy on the planet. Uh, but interesting enough, 15% of you still think that the Western countries will remain economically dominant. So you don't foresee a wholesale move from West to East, which is, which is interesting. Well, I hope that was a bit of fun. And uh, in case it wasn't, there's the bad news is we're going to repeat the quiz at the end just to see whether you've changed your mind. So I'll just click again. So it now comes to the main attraction, and it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce to you the uh, UK strategy director for PricewaterhouseCoopers, obviously a leading uh, global consultancy, Barrett Kupelian, who is going to talk to us about the global economy in 2050. Um, Barrett graduated uh, from Warwick in economics, did a master's degree in economics and finance, and ever since then has been part of PwC, which is no mean achievement in the world of consultancy. And he's done extensive work at looking at the mega trends that are going to be facing us in 2050 from an economic, but also political and, and technological perspective. And it's with great pleasure that I invite Barrett to the stage. Please, Barrett. Thank you. Thank you very much for that glorious introduction. So I won't dwell, dwell on me. Um, but actually, I will say that China is already the largest economy in the world. It depends how you count it, but we'll, we'll go through some of the slides in a bit. Um, now, this is the agenda I've got for, uh, for today. So a lot of the, what I'll be speaking about is about a report that we do in PwC called The World in 2050. It's, is it here? This one? Yeah. So a lot of the stuff I'll be speaking about is based off a report that we do every two, three years, or maybe longer sometimes, um, depending on what happens in the world, called The World in 2050. Uh, but all that report does is it projects forward the size of economies, the, the largest sort of 30 economies in the world, and also income levels within those economies. But before I do that, I'll start, first of all, defining what economic activity is so that everyone is quite comfortable with, with the definitions that we're going to use. Get some technical terms out of the way. Then I'll speak about what our view was in 2017, because that's the last time we did the report. Then I'll pause. You can throw me any questions you want to. And then we will be updating our report by the end of the year in anticipation of uh, Davos at the World Economic Forum. So I will sort of start to tell you about the third agenda point, which is, you know, what has changed since 2017, which we'll sort of incorporate in our forecasts going forward, which is actually quite different since 2017 because quite a lot has happened. So let's start off with the first thing, you know, what's the PwC World in 2050 report? Essentially, as I said, it's a report that shows how the global economic order will change by the year 2050. Uh, so essentially, we forecast uh, both in terms of GDP, which is the total value of goods and services produced in an economy, and in GDP per capita, so total values of, of, of goods and services produced in an economy relative to population, for around 30 economies. And that includes the G20 economies, uh, as well as some other sort of smaller economies that will be much bigger by, by 2050. Uh, and all of this is based on, a, on an economic model, which, is, which we call the world in 2050 model. Uh, so we, we we look at the value, we look at GDP, which is, you know, the value of goods and services produced in an economy. You could argue that there are much better, more holistic measures of economic development, economic, social, environmental, political indicators that could provide a more holistic view. We aren't doing that. 
partly because you don't have a lot of data for some of the smaller economies. Um, this report is the one of the most popular reports that that's consistently downloaded on the PwC website. We launched it at Davos in 2017, but we we always launch it at Davos at periodic intervals. Uh, it it is used by number ten. It, it has been used a, a lot by number ten, particularly pre pre the referendum. It has been used by Michel Barnier as well in his presentations to sort of show and illustrate the the, the economic power of the EU going forward. Now, as I said, we did the work in 2017. So the conclusions I will show you are as at 2017. So I think that in itself is interesting. And then, and then I think it will be also quite interesting to sort of see how the, the future is gonna, gonna look like given some of the changes that have happened between 2017 and 2022. So first of all, uh, the first question you might have in your minds is how how the hell will I be able to tell you what GDP will be in the UK by 2050? You know what what what's the sort of framework we use to to carry out this this type of uh, forecast? And you know I would go back to economic theory. And if you look at economic theory, it sort of states that economic growth or the size of an economy is determined by its factors of production. And there's essentially two factors of production: labor, so the number of people are working age in an economy capital, how much you put into buildings, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And then the third point is total factor productivity. So it's essentially how efficiently you use labor and capital. Now we've got four here. So we've got, first of all, the first one is, you know, growth is determined by investment in physical capital, which is what I, which is the capital element of the equation. Then you've got the working age population. So the number of people of working age in an economy, the more number of people of working age, the, the bigger the economy, you would think if they're integrated into the workforce. The third one is how well you use labor. So it's, it's again, you know, the, the, the education levels, which augments uh, the, the second factor of production. And then the third one is this total factor productivity, which is essentially how efficiently you use those inputs to generate outputs in an, in an economy. And, and, you know, you can sort of predict these numbers with, with over a long term period of time with relative degree of accuracy because demographics don't really change rapidly. So what happens now is, is we'll sort of determine what happens in the next 20, 30, 40 years. You get projections of those numbers from the UN, for example. Investment levels, you know, they, they hover above and below a certain means. So you can sort of assume that that uh, will sort of continue in the future. And then finally, you, you need to assume a productivity factor which actually is quite dependent on technology. That's probably the most uncertain bit of the model. But you can sort of take a look at long-term averages and make judgments about degrees of catch-ups uh, between the economies and also how the technological leader will sort of uh, evolve in the future. Now, we are being quite honest. We, you know, the, this type of modeling doesn't sort of um, predict short-term variations in, in the economy. You sort of assume a path the, towards the future but realistically, what's ha what happens is that an economy goes above and below that sort of projected path. Business cycles go up and down. You, you, know, you, you sort of uh, need to be a bit more realistic about, about that sort of things. And, and then the third point is, you know, we assume no, no major sort of global catastrophe, no major wars. That's probably changed a bit. No sort of asteroid collisions, um, no sort of political shifts that cut economies from access to ideas or people or capital which is sort of changing a bit as well, which we'll talk about a bit in the future. And one more bit of terminology. Um, you might have seen, you know, some sort of um, these type of analysis in the public domain. The Economist, for example, recently ran a piece on the size of economy. I think they focused a bit on China. But usually when you refer to GDP, you sort of uh, define it in, in sort of two different units. One is the market exchange rate approach. So you can say, you know, the UK economy uh, GDP is $2 trillion. So that's the market exchange rates. Uh, but the problem there is, you know, when Brexit happened, sterling depreciated by about 10%, 10, 15%, depending on where you look at. So overnight, you could say, oh, the UK economy shrank by 15% in dollar terms. That's the, that's the disadvantage of market exchange rates. It, it tends to fluctuate. The other measure is the so-called purchasing power parity one which takes into account all the price differences across the economies and it adjusts for that. So for example, it takes into account that a haircut in the UK costs 15 pounds and that it costs probably five cents in India and sort of puts that on a level playing field. So it's, PPP is much more of a purist 
approach in, in measuring GDP by taking into account these price differences. It's the measure that economists prefer, actually. The sad thing is that businesses, you know, sort of exchange trade and goods in dollars in market exchange rates and not in PPPs. It's a notional concept. But we will be focusing for the duration of this presentation, most of the analysis is in PPP terms. So we we, we, let's, uh, we took that out of the way as well. Uh, oh, one more thing as well. I, I mean, I said, you know, economic growth is determined by these factors of production that we've got here. I know that a lot of economists are getting sick about whether their theories stack up or not. So what we've we've done is we've done a little analysis here to look at historic growth rates and the relationships with some of those variables that I that I pointed out. And essentially what the table at the bottom tells you is that countries that have high levels of income to start off with grow slower. That's because the, 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 the potential for catch up is, is naturally lower. Countries that invest more grow faster. Countries that have a higher sort of educational attainment grow faster. So, you know, it sort of proves that the, 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 some of the things that I told you with respect to the uh, theories are more or less empirically proven. Right. So what did we say was going to happen to the global economy in, in 2017? So the chart on the left-hand side gives you the rankings of, of the economies by GDP in 2016 and in 2050. Surprise, surprise, China is number one in PPP terms. In market exchange rates, it's not. But actually, if you adjust for those price differentials, that tends to favor emerging economies like China. And that's why they appear a bit bigger. So China was the largest economy in 2016 on a PPP basis, US, uh, second, India, Japan, China. So you can see that the G7 economy sort of feature in the, in the 2016 uh, sort of uh, column. Anything in gray are, are sort of advanced economies. Anything in, in sort of pink is uh, emerging economies. But you can see by, by 2050, the ranking changes. So the first two largest economies are China and are expected to be China and India. The US still is up there. Then, then Indonesia, Brazil, Russia, Mexico. So out of the top seven economies, only one of the economies was expected to be uh, an advanced economy. And then if you go further down the, the order, you've got Japan, Germany, and the UK. So key finding number one is that. The second point sort of tells you what the share of world GDP is, is in PPP terms for those 30 economies, which you can you know, approximate as the world. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the bottom right-hand side. We've sort of defined the G7. I mean, that's the, the term that's used quite uh, intensively in the press, which is US, Japan, Germany, UK, France, Italy, and uh, Canada, which is missing on that, on that. Oh yeah, there it is in the next, uh, next line. And then the E7 are the BRIC economies. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, plus Mexico, Turkey, and Indonesia. So you, you can see in 2016, if you take out the rest of the world component, the G7 and the E7, the E7 was slightly bigger than the, than the G7, but by 2050, we expect the size, the economic size of the E7 economies to be significantly bigger than the G7 economies. We'll talk a bit about what's driving that as well later on. Now let's focus a bit more on, on some of the individual economies. So again, this slide reiterates the point that you know, some of the emerging economies will be growing faster and hence will be one of the, the bigger economies uh, in the world. What this tells you is you know, which ones are in our ranking, the biggest risers and which ones are the biggest followers, again, in PPP terms. Biggest risers, you can see Vietnam, Philippines, Nigeria, emerging economies. Uh, biggest fallers is Australia, Italy, Spain, advanced economies. So this is, again, all in, in absolute economic size terms, not per capita terms. And then just to reiterate the point about the E7, G7 sort of shares of global GDP, you can see here we've sort of decomposed it in, in a different manner. If you just focus on the two left-hand side bits of the chart. So 2016, the contribution, well, not the contribution, the size of the G7, which are the red economies, and the E7, China, India, and the, and the rest, was slightly, the E7 was slightly bigger, but by 2050, we sort of expect the E7 will be about 1.2 times bigger than the G7 economies. So that's in PPP terms. And then the same story applies in market exchange, uh, market exchange rate terms. Um, so, you know, this, this trend was one of the sort of key findings of, of the report when we did it back in uh, 2017. This, this then gives you the, um, <clears throat> the shares of the world economy, but over time, so you can see China's relatively, you know, in terms of its size as a share of the global economy, 
it's expected to remain relatively constant. I think the, the, the bigger story for me is India, uh, which we said back in 2017 was going to sort of pick up in pace, and it is. Actually, there's quite a lot of fundamentals that, that favor India, uh, in addition to the fact that, in addition, taking into account it's, it is the largest democracy in the world, so there's a bit of a favoritism there from the US as well. But if you look at the US and the EU, a bit sort of decreasing in importance, but actually, if you add up the Western world by the by the US and the EU 27, you'll see that they are slightly bigger in China in combined terms. Um, of course, it's EU 27 because we hadn't we had a Brexit back uh, when we did the report. So if we project this, if we put these conclusions on a map, you'll see that the the, the areas that are in red are the economies that will be experiencing sort of faster growth and as a result they will be sort of growing the fastest you can see that most of the red economies are you know in emerging sort of market uh, territory areas so look at brazil you could look at china and india look at the southeastern european area russia was an interesting one but i think that that was that's that's probably going to change uh the us has good and solid demographics so that's why it's in the red area and, and that helps mexico as well but you you can sort of see this this the story that we, that we got back in 2017 was that you know the US as the as, as the strap line says the US and Europe will settle lose ground relative to the Asian giants as the center of the economic gravity shifts to the east so you're seeing that west to east shift in terms of the size of the economies any surprises there yeah it, it, I mean it was back in 2017. It was it was driven. Russia was driven a lot by uh, what we assumed back then was technological conversions, um, and you know they were commodity rich as well, which actually favors. If you if you actually look at this this table over here, you'll see that the last line we're saying that the, those who 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 export those, the countries that are primary commodity exporters tend to grow a bit faster than normal, and Russia was one of those countries. Whereas that situation has now changed with, with the war, actually, and, and um, the crony capitalism, actually, of, of Russia, which is not growth inducive. So, so shift from the West to the East. What this chart over here does is um, it sort of portrays the same image, it's the same story, but all it tells you is the rate of change of growth of the different economies for, for various decades. No surprises that you know the emerging economies will be growing faster, partly because of that catch up, partly because of the demographics and some of the other factors we, we we spoke together. Whereas the growth rates in most of the Western economies will be in the one to two region, one to two percent region. Uh, the interesting thing for me though is is this chart over here, which decomposes the future growth rates into the different components, and and this chart over here decomposes your future economic growth into the growth that will come from population growth. So you've got more people. And as a result, you know, if your labor force is growing, that naturally will lead to more growth. Or the other factors of production I talked about. So the yellow basically incorporates two things. It's the capital investment angle of it. And then it's the productivity angle. But if you take a look at a country like Nigeria, which is the, the, the first one I've circled on the left-hand side, Nigeria will be growing fast. So at about, you know, four, four and a half percent on average between 2016 and 2050. But actually 50% of that growth will be coming through its larger growth of its population. So, you know, in some ways I call that easy growth because you've got people coming into the, the workforce. All you need to do is utilize them. The tougher thing is when you don't have population growth and you need to use your workforce much more productively. So if you look at the more advanced sort of economies, USA, the UK, uh, Italy, Japan, a lot of the growth in those economies because of the demographics needs to come from either investment, you know, investing more or utilizing your existing resources more efficiently. And historically, that's what's happened in advanced economies. Most of the growth has been led by productivity, not the growth of labor force. And one of the problems we have, particularly post the global financial crisis, was that productivity growth has been low. I mean, that's what we keep on saying in the UK. Productivity growth has plateaued. It, it, the productivity is the elixir of growth for advanced economies. If you don't have that, the, your only sort of resort is, is to actually grow your population to, to generate growth in the future. 
Poland is the other interesting one. So you can see that for Poland, the population, the demographics, particularly of Eastern European countries, is not great. But you will see that most of the growth in Poland, so we're, we're saying 3% growth on average over the 2016 to 2050 period, but a lot of the growth will come through the investment channel, will come through the productivity angle. And there's a few reasons for that. The single market, so the, Poland has access to the single market, that automatically makes the technological catch-up much more easier. And then, and then also the fact that it's starting from a lower base, so that there's greater, there's greater catch-up potential. Other economies that are quite interesting, so you can see Pakistan, the Philippines, they're, they're quite a lot of demographic boost is coming through the, you know, the red bars of the, or the red lines. There's a fly. Any, any questions so far? Now, up until now, I, the, the story in terms of the size of the economies, so GDP in absolute terms, has been that you know, there's going to be a shift from the West to the East, pretty consistent. But actually, what this chart over here to the right-hand side shows you is GDP per capita. So economic output on per capita terms. And if you adjust those growth rates and apply them, adjust them for the population, you'll see that you know, advanced economies in income levels will still be significantly ahead of emerging economies. And the reason for that is because you know, the US, Germany, UK, et cetera, they're, they're already starting from a high income base. So even if they're growing slowly in relative terms, in income levels, you will have in, in, in absolute income levels, those economies will have significantly higher levels of income compared to the Turkeys, the Chinas, and the Mexicans of the world. It's quite interesting. If you look at China, for example, what we're saying is that in PPP terms, so we're adjusting for these price differences, by 2050, income levels in China will be what we are experiencing right now in the UK on average terms. So, you know, I, I, I am fully cognizant of the message I told you, which is this shift from the West to the East. But let's not forget that in income levels, the Western economies will still be superior in a or, or higher. So whenever you hear, you know, these, you know, or the Brexit opportunity, the, the economies of the Far East will be growing faster. That is very true. They will be growing faster. But, you know, don't forget advanced economies. They will have high, people will have high levels of income. So if, if you're a business, actually, let me go to this. So if you're a business, I mean, what... You know, the, the GDP story, which is the shift of economic gravity from the West towards the East, that's great if you're a growing business and you want to tap into new markets. So you, you, can, you can do that. That's great for world poverty because you would expect these markets, you know, that have lower levels of income to actually grow, eliminate poverty or reduce poverty as China has done in the past decade. So that's a great story. But actually, you know, the, the other story that we shouldn't forget is that GDP per capita or incomes will continue to remain significantly higher in advanced economies. So that means that consumers in the Western world will demand much more sophisticated products and goods and services than those people in, in, advanced, in, in emerging economies. So, you know, the, the, let's not completely write off advanced economies is the message I'm trying to get at. And, you know, I sort of illustrate that, that story with this map over here. The, the map on the left-hand side is the GDP map that you've seen, which sort of tells you, you know, emerging economies will be growing fast in absolute terms, et cetera. But if you look at the, the chart on the right-hand side, which sort of tells you the GDP per capita growth story, you will see that quite a lot of them are focused on advanced economies. The US, look at the European economies, they're, they're red or orange, look at Australia. So, you know, whenever we hear the story about, you know, forget, forget the advanced economies, I don't think that's entirely fair. So that is where we were in 2017. Any, any, yeah, go for it. Well, you will get, oh, good question. Um, in absolute terms, your economy will grow if you manage to reintegrate that additional population. To grow on a GDP per capita basis, you will need to integrate those people into, into the, the, the workforce, plus get productivity growth or invest a bit more. Most of these economies do that. I mean, the, the good thing with the, with the Indonesias and the Chinas of the world is that their productivity levels are very low. 
So they've got that catch up element as well to, to, to go with, and they can tap onto the technological developments of the West. But with the West, it's much more difficult because you don't have a lot of population growth or integration of the workforce, or, or, or you can call it whatever you want. So we are very much reliant on business investment and on productivity growth. And in the UK, productivity business investment has plateaued. Productivity growth hasn't really grown since the global financial crisis. And that's why we're not seeing in the UK the two and a half, three percent growth rates. Well, two and a half that, that we were used to in the 97 to 2006 era. We did see quite a lot of growth in the UK in the, when the coalition government was in, um, in power. But actually, if you decompose that into the um, different factors of production, it was population growth that, that sort of led to the 2%, 2.5% growth rates we had for some of the years, which in turn was driven by immigration from Europe. So a lot of it was volume growth. It was more people. It wasn't productivity growth. And now that we're, that that type is sort of gone, and we don't have any productivity growth and business investment, that's why we're, we're getting quite low growth rates in the UK. Does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, if you look, so the, the question is about um, uh, the, the rate of growth of the workforce in the UK and how that's not translating to growth, right? Is that, is that fair? I mean, Immigration numbers, I mean, the numbers, you know, 600,000 or whatever, the, the, the UK workforce is what, 30 million people? So the immigration numbers aren't high, really, to affect, to, to move the dial up at the, you know, the, at, at, at the GDP level. The UK is much more reliant on productivity growth. Uh, the, the immigration point is, and, and it's seasonal as well sometimes, doesn't really drive, unless you've got a million, two million people coming in a, a year into the country of all working age, you won't see those that massive impact on the top line. And you're right, demographics like native population growth isn't isn't that much uh, that much greater. Uh, that, that is the, the major issue that most advanced economies have. Uh, I saw another hand being raised. Good question. Good question. I mean, the, 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 so the question was about whether the language of business will change given, given what I just said. Um, I, I mean, the example I go with is the EU, which, which is, seems to have stuck to English as, um, as, as the, 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 the language for business. Uh, they, they haven't switched to French, even you know, despite the active lobbying and the francophonie and, and all that. So I, I doubt it will. And, and India being a former colony as well, and English being you know, spoken quite widely, I don't think it will. Uh, but that's pure speculation on my behalf. Any other questions? Right. So, yeah. No, no, go for it, go for it. Yeah, the, the, the ranking. Yeah. This one. Oh, right, 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 yes, yes. Uh, in terms of size, yeah.
that's beyond economics. But 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 what what, what I could but I, what what I would say is a couple of things. So think think of these lines as um, measures of economic clout, which is essentially what we're trying to capture. You know, if you're a bigger proportion of the global economy, you've sort of got bigger footprint, and you can. You know that that will have implications for potentially military power, political power on the international arena, etc. So that's point number one. And the, and the second point I would say is I think the more interesting thing for businesses um, uh, on this chart is the fact that there's there's one line that is upward trending. There there's one line that's upward trending, which essentially implies change. So if, if you had India in the end 2016 being what 7% of the global economy and by 2050 it's 15%, that implies that you know India and its relationship with the rest of the world will probably change the most just because it's you know the starting and, and ending points are quite different. Whereas if you look at the US and the EU lines, I mean they start off with 15 and go down to 12 or something. So you know it's it, it's a more boring story in some ways. I think the more interesting thing there is that you might get much more coordination between the EU and the US just because if you want to sort of um, overpower the Chinas of the world, you, you need to, to be in cooperation with someone. Um, that, that's sort of my interpretation of this chart. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, so what's changed? I mean, look, all of this analysis was done in 2017. A lot has happened since then. Um, once in a generation event. So I said, I think one of our assumptions was no pandemics. We had a pandemic, but it didn't last long. That's the, that's a positive thing. War on the European continent, populism spreading in, in big, big economies of the world. Uh, globalization has changed. So the innocence of the beginning of the 21st century type globalization is no longer there. Uh, Projections about future populations have changed, which, which you know, they, they get revised. And then there's a big question mark about technological developments. Now, the way we think about these things in PwC is, is the so-called, oh, the room went dark, uh, the megatrends. So by megatrends, what we mean is, you know, the, the, the trends that will define business and society in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And, you know, the, the stuff you see here isn't, isn't exactly a surprise. So one of them is climate change, which will be determining uh, what businesses, people and society acts and thinks about for the next 10, 20 years, technological disruption, demographic shifts, the fracturing world and social instability. I'll focus on the ones that are underlined here for the purpose and then sort of extrapolate what I think that could mean for the world in 2050. I think the more interesting thing for me is, is the fracturing world. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there saying, um, we are in a new phase of globalization. Some people call it deglobalization. Uh, but before we get into that, I think you know, back in 2017, when we when we carried out these projections, the key assumption that we that was inbuilt was that there was going to be this smooth transfer of technology, people, ideas from the advanced economies to the emerging economies, as we'd seen at the late 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century. I think that has now stop to exist. We also assumed that free trade would sort of continue in, in, in its form back in 2017. I think it's quite clear that that's sort of changed as well. So then this has an automatic implication at the level of convergence of those economies to sort of, you know, Western, Western type levels. It, it completely changes the formula. Now, in, in PwC, the, the terminology we use about how we think globalization will, will sort of evolve in the future is, I, I, I use this term, slowbalization. So that essentially means globalization will still continue, but it will not continue at the pace that, that, that we, we sort of experienced probably before 2016, 2015. And, you know, there's a couple of speeches I sort of refer to, uh, which, which really define uh, how the world has changed. One of them was by Mike Sullivan, uh, 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 um, Biden's national security advisor. He really, in detail, split out the US's vision of, of how they see the global trading and economic system evolving in the future. And the other one is by Janet Yellen as well, the US Treasury Secretary. But essentially, I think, you know, historically, what would happen is, you know, if I wanted to import, I don't know, chairs, or semiconductors, I would sort of 
place my factory in the cheapest low cost sort of country and then make sure I have adequate logistical networks to sort of make sure that I can get the product from one end of the world to the other end of the world. The pandemic changed that. The rivalry between China and the US has completely changed that. So I think globalization for me has sort of three measures, three, three feet, three legs is, is a better expression. So I think for, for sort of strategic products like semiconductors, what we're seeing is reshoring. So placing your sort of semiconductor plant back into the EU or in your home country, back into the UK, back into the US. And you can see the massive subsidies that these economies have sort of um, uh, enacted just to make sure that's happening. So for strategic sectors of the economy, we're seeing that happen. The other thing that we're seeing is the so-called friend-shoring. So if I'm, um, if I'm producing cars, I would like to make sure that my plants or my factories are placed in, in economies that share similar values to me. So that photographs out China, that brings in Singapore, Japan, um, India those economies that share similar values. And by similar values, I mean similar political systems, democracies, essentially. And the US has made this clear. They, they coined the term French shoring. And we're already seeing that happen. Apple had 100% of its production in China. They're moving some of it to, they moved some of it to Texas. They're moving some of it into India. And they've said they will continue to do that. We're seeing that more and more uh, uh, in, the, in the international trading system. So, you know, if, if I'm China, that that globalization era that that favored me because there was the you know the Apple would place its production center in China immediately without any fear of fervor. I think that that innocence is gone. And then last but not least, I think for non-strategic products like you know chairs and doors, I think people are still happy to make sure that that's in any low-cost destination. So what we're increasingly seeing is that you know globalization, as defined by the trading of goods, has plateaued as a proportion of the economy. Services are still being actively traded across uh, different economies. We are also seeing that capital movements are a bit more strategic now. So then, you know, you don't have that freedom of capital of uh, freedom of movement of capital as we, we'd seen in the past. And also the freedom of movement of people is changing as well, both in advanced economies, but also with, within countries. So all of this leads me to think that we, we're sort of going to see the fragmented world you know, sort of, I think it's much more of a likely scenario than the alternative scenario of openness being restored and going back to you know what what we sort of were in uh, the pre-pandemic era. And and I think you know if you're in that fragmented world, there will be a slower transfer of goods, services, ideas, and people across borders. And I think that means that this convergence, this shift from the west to the east that I spoke about, that we assumed was going to happen at a relatively decent pace between now and 2050, I think that will take a longer period of time. Because you know, China, for example, does not have uh, know-how in the semiconductors industry. They will have to develop that domestically rather than borrow the technology from the West, and that will take more time. And you can apply this sort of concept in, into a variety of different um, different sorts of industries. So I think I think that means this economic convergence will probably take slower, uh, longer to to actually materialize than what we thought. This shift from the West to the East, I think, will take uh, a longer period of time. The second point is technological disruption. Um, as I said, one of the uh, factors of production is, is you know, labor, capital, and then how efficiently you use those two. And technology is a critical component of that. I think as human beings, we haven't been great whenever there has been a new technology to immediately incorporate that into our working lives and make sure it leads to you know, much more productive and healthier lives. But there's quite a lot of exciting technologies coming through AI being, you know, the, the, the most popular one right now, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, all of these concepts. So I think there is a big question mark on, on how efficiently, how fast, and, and even if we can actually incorporate this in an efficient manner in our working lives. Because one of the key, key sort of drivers of growth, as I told you, particularly for advanced economies, is technological change. So if AI is purposed to be, you know, this, this great miracle, you know, if we manage to incorporate that into our working lives, I think that will be a boon, particularly for advanced economies, because they will have the productivity growth, the elixir of growth that they have been missing for the past decade. So that's another big question mark. This also has implications for emerging economies. I think it's probably net negative for the emerging economies. 
Because again, you know, if you can create stuff much more efficiently in advanced economies, why why sort of you know set up a plant in 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 cheaper economies if you can have it homegrown? And then the demographic shifts. So I mean, demographic trends are relatively predictable. Um, and, and they have actually changed in some of the emerging economies. I think the UN came up with projections around, I think, six months ago. And it was quite telling uh, how lower the fertility rates were in emerging economies than initially expected. So, you know, these type of movements actually affect your long-term growth projections. It essentially means that emerging economies will be less reliant on, um, on demographic the demographic impenses to growth, but much more reliant on technological developments and productivity growth. So one of the economies I think I had up here was, um, where was it? Nigeria. So Nigeria, you can see about 50% of the growth in the future between 2016 and 2050, we reckon was going to come from demographic growth. That number has been revised dramatically down. The, the population growth in Nigeria is, is much smaller than what we'd anticipated, which has implications for the future. And then last but not least, I mean, the big question mark for me is the social instability that we're seeing, particularly in advanced economies, which is economically harmful. So if you don't, if, you, if you've got a degree of hate developing between different, po different pockets of your existing population, and uh, you know we've we've seen that that leads to suboptimal economic outcomes. It leads to populism. Populism is something businesses don't like because it leads to suboptimal policies. It leads to unpredictable policies. So businesses can plan and forecast. Households can plan and forecast. And as a result, that could lead to some some sort of turbulence um, and sort of the the make make the growth um, uh, forecasts a bit more uncertain. And I think that's it. So key takeaways. Um, so we, we spoke about the world economy and, and how we expect it to double in size by 2050. We spoke about the shifts in global economic power, but that, that assumes that, you know, this transfer of technology people ideas continues smoothly. That's probably a bigger, big, uh, more unlikely going forward. Uh, emerging economies will drive global growth because of their size, but to do that, they'll need to implement structural reforms. But I think the other point is that, you know, rising incomes in emerging markets will open up great opportunities, but do not write off advanced economies because they will have high levels of income. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and you're happy to take any questions from here, there. I think, yeah, the chat says there's four questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Right. There's so much to talk about. So I think, you know, whether it's aging populations, whether it's technology, productivity improvements, shifts from east to from west to east, etc. But before we do all of that, we go back to our poll okay. to see whether you feel better or worse now after listening to uh, Barrett. So get your phone ready uh, online as well, and then we'll see where we go to. So let me just forward this on. Okay, so here we go. So I'll give you 10 seconds just to do this QR code and the number if you haven't already got it. Everybody ready? One gentleman is trying, so I'll give it a couple of seconds. But I think really, thank you very much, uh, Barrett. That was really, really interesting. And it's, what is even more interesting is how, how uh, fragile change is. You know, 2017 pandemic, Ukraine, technological changes that you couldn't foresee. I think the nice thing about the world in 2050 is that the reason why we pitched the whole series really for that time frame is because it's relatively close enough to look at something one generation ahead. And I think that's going to be the defining uh, era over the next two, two or three decades is how quickly things will change and what are the flows and the direction in which that change takes place. And most of that, is already being sown today or is in the process of being sown. So, you know, all of us have a, have a role to play in this. Right, we're going back to the questions. So first one is, standards of living will be higher and we'll all be better off in 2050. Please vote. Okay, I'll give it a bit longer. Oh. A bit more optimistic than before. Pardon? 
a bit more optimistic, right? It is. You sold a good story about it. You're going to be, I suppose it depends where in the world you're going to be living, but I think in general, it's good to see that the uh, per capita yeah. income yeah. of the Western economies will still be quite healthy. Okay, that's good. We'll capture the rest as we go along. I'll go for the next one. I hope the CV goes up. Will the UK be more or less important to the global economy in 2050? Well, I think you had a slide that actually showed that, so it would be interesting to see. Okay. The positive is draining away. 89% are saying less. And I think that's that's reflecting in the in the chart you showed in the in the work to 2017. Interesting enough though, my country where I come from originally, Germany, has a much bigger fall in terms of uh, in terms of uh, income. So that's good. So I think again, uh, not so positive about the UK. So I think this something we need to probably discuss and then finally which one statement best summarizes how you feel about the global economy in 2050 please vote now okay so i, th I think I, I think the only thing that really is changing here is we we feel slightly that the less that the rich will be richer we feel a bit more confident that the western countries are going to remain economically dominant uh, china is still there in the background as dominating things and uh, sadly nobody thinks we're going to have solved poverty world poverty by by 2050 okay well hopefully that you found that useful so there's been some change in the first talk with hamish we ended up with exactly the same result that we had at the beginning as at the end. So there's been some change. So that's excellent. So what I'll do is I'll stop the share and we're going to start the Q&A session. So let me just uh, make sure I can get the audience online as well. Bear with me. Okay, so... They should all be there. I need to disconnect. Why are they not showing now? No, we should have uh, got the results. I'm sure that Oli might come up and, and solve that little technical problem for us so we can get rid of the, the survey and we actually show the people on the screen that are in there. But let's start the Q&A session whilst Oli is going to come upstairs and solve our technical I'm going to go around with the, with the microphone. We start off in the room, but if you could speak directly into it, please, that would be really helpful. Who wants to be going first? We've got two gentlemen there, so you first, and then one, two, three. Good. Right. Um, you were quite optimistic about artificial intelligence. Um, uh, the main difference between now and then is that it's going to happen much much faster but in fact uh artificial intelligence could wipe out hmm. enormous slices of, of professional labor in this country and wouldn't that have a bigger impact it, it depends how we manage it I, I seem to remember there was um was it bill gates a few years back who i mean he was talking about robots but he, he was proposing that robots pay tax you know the idea there being that capital gets taxed appropriately so you can mitigate the distributional impact. So I, it really does depend how we manage it. And, and I think that's the big question mark. It could go terribly wrong in a variety of ways. Um, and I think it's only now we've sort of started to realize with this publicly available tool, ChatGPT, which which has sort of proved to, um, to completely... Uh, have changed uh, how you get about doing things. Interestingly, in PwC, I can't access ChatGPT. Certain bits of the firm are already using it on a trial basis. So, for example, our legal service, you know, to go, to go through mounds of, of legal documents, I think they're using, you know, sort of, but, you know, it's been tried, tested. Our clients know that we're using it. They, they've been trained to, to, to sort of understand 
at the pitfalls of, of AI, you know, where it does mistakes and it doesn't. So, you know, you sort of need to incorporate it in your daily lives, but I think you need to be quite careful. Uh, I don't think we've got the answer yet, that, that's for sure. No, absolutely. I think uh, the youngsters in the universities are using ChatGPT yeah, yeah, to write their thesis and then realize that actually the Harvard referencing is made up by ChatGPT yeah. and they found out. Yeah. So interesting, not quite there yet. I just wanted to pick up on your topic of Germany versus Britain. Why is, why is Germany forecast to slow down quicker than Britain? Because surely they're taking in more people. So yeah, the, interesting, the, uh, but Barrett, Barrett will have a much better uh, answer than German, me. German demographics were horrible from memory when, when we did the work. It was it was horrible. But I think we did incorporate because because John John Hawksworth, who, who was the one who was our chief, chief economist back then, I think we he delayed releasing the report because you had about you know the, the, the large migration wave in 2016. I think he incorporated that, but that was a one-off. It wasn't um uh, it wasn't, um, you know, something continuous, but but the UK generally, in terms of fertility rates, is it was one of the champions of Europe. That's why it was a bit more favourable. But even that is changing. How much has changed in your next about Britain since We we haven't thought about it uh, fully, but I think the demographics are unfavourable, as favourable as they were in 2016. Um, because fertility rates have gone down probably because of the economic situation i would have thought uh and secondly because productivity has been abysmal yeah but i think also uh germany has always been heralded as having really high productivity and i think the high the productivity gains yeah have a certain ceiling and therefore if you don't if you have a, a, a slowing po population and even allowing for immigration and then you can't increase your productivity that's an issue. So really, I, I think the winners in terms of productivity will be those countries who are going to harness the, the technology. And when we talk about technology in the future, we are talking artificial intelligence. So it'll be interesting. Over to you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. Uh, but the, um, the economic uh, nations, which will be stronger in um, uh, in 2050 are, are the nations that pump um, more carbon dioxide into the world. We are faced with 30 million people in the world have nowhere to put their rubbish. Rivers are being blocked by plastics. And it seems that we go on uh, in... Uh, uh, I could illustrate uh, mm, uh, mm, the mm. Um, natural world in the United Kingdom has lost uh, it, over half its natural plant and uh, uh, life, and we uh, insects are decreasing mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. thing. And th th this uh, is ignored by your thesis. Uh, and um, will there be a world uh, on which the uh, how long will the planet last is uh, my query. Uh, let me start off with, I think, two or three positive points. For the first time ever, we've got the three major economic blocks, China, the US and the European Union, all aligned on the climate change agenda. So we, we've got that. We, we never had that before in the past. And, you know, they, they, they accept the science and they want to deal with it and commit resources to it. So that's the, the probably the, the most positive point out of all of this in terms of the future and tackling um, climate change. The second point, I think, is, um, you know, if you, if you take a look at the charts of uh, the, the future trajectory of population uh, from the UN, Historically, I think they sort of, you know, the, it sort of goes up, you, there's a peak, and then humans naturally sort of reduce in, in terms of numbers over a hundred year period of time. Now, I think in the latest UN projections, that peak has gone lower. So from, from a resource pressure perspective, I suppose it means that the, 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 the pressure on resources will be less than what we thought initially. So maybe a bit more of a positive thing. But, and the third thing I would say is probably the, um, the biggest question mark is the role of tech in helping us decarbonize, save, preserve, and grow the environment. 
um, and and hopefully there is something there. But you're right. I mean, what what this basically means is that that economic growth that we're sort of forecasting is much more precarious because the way climate change operates is that you get more extreme climate phenomena in different parts of the world, more extreme, more unpredictable, which then has economic costs. You know, if you get more floodings, that's that's an economic cost. Yeah. Uh, so it does make the, the forecast more uncertain and fragile. But the, the positive side is that there will potentially be massive amounts of money being spent on dealing with these issues, which from a from purist GDP perspective is positive. Because as I said in the beginning, we don't take into account, you know, the more holistic developmental measures um, uh, of, of what economic development is constant. We just purely focus on the, uh, you know, the post-World War II manufacturing concept of GDP. If you look at more holistic measures, I think the story might be a bit different. Okay, that's very helpful. And obviously, if there's going to be lots of migration because of climate mm -hmm. change, 50 to 100 yeah. million, let's say, you know, it all depends on how welcoming the, the destination countries are. So, you know, there's some, some issues to be had. I'm just going to tell the online audience, you can unmute yourself now and show your video and ask a question directly off Barat. But until you do that, I'm just going to read out a question from the chat room. But please feel free to unmute and ask your question personally online. Uh, I've got a question here from Debbie Lawley. How meaningful is high GDP per person when the proportion of the working population is decreasing? So unable to service an aging population. Sorry, how? How, how meaningful yeah. is a high GDP per capita when the proportion of the working population is decreasing? So unable to service the aging population. Well, I think the inbuilt assumption there is you, you do have less people of working age, but they generate more. And, and they generate more because they're more productive. You know, they, they utilize the historical experience of people doing whatever they do, plus they add on on top of it. That's why productivity growth, again, is so important. If you don't have that and you've got an aging population, you are stuffed yeah. because it means you're going to you'll have to cut back. Okay. Yeah, and that's why Japan, for example, are hev heavily investors in technology yeah. and productivity. Well, but Japan's done other things. I mean, Japan has, has been a champion in in increasing its workforce by incorporating more women in their labor force, in their workforce. They've been they've been an absolute champion yeah. in the past 10, 15 years. Um, I mean, the other angle is increasing. So, a couple even if you've got declining populations, there, there's a, there's a couple of tricks you can go with increasing the participation of women into the workforce. Even though your population is decreasing, you're you're increasing yeah. the, the inflow, and then older workers as well mm. is the other one. Yeah, good. The other one is how important is Taiwan to the future of semiconductors, given the current political landscape and obviously China well, uh, I mean, having to import them. My, my understanding is that Taiwan is a leader, undisputed leader in the semiconductors business, and I think that's why there's this dash to build similar plants in Western economies at a very rapid scale. You know, A to, you know, there's a concentration risk there, relying on one economy in a fragile part of the world. Uh, well, there's, those are the two points, I suppose, relying on one economy. And secondly, uh, fragile parts of the world. And thirdly, semiconductors are in everything. You know, it's even in toasters. So um, it's a quite fundamental bit of the economy that, that, that I think people realized during the pandemic on, on how important it was. Okay, one more question online before we go back in the mm. room. Um, interesting one. Would you agree that countries such as China and India should be barred from using dirty growth strategies in the future? Uh, and whether we can even bar, how we would bar them? That's more of an ethical um slash philosophical uh, uh, question i mean i could see arguments on both sides uh but but the one argument that is not heralded i think that much is um unlike in the past where you know the uk has developed using fossil fuels the technology exists to sort of grow in a much more green friendly manner um and in, in relatively cheaply fashion i suppose which sometimes people omit and forget. Okay, we're going back into yeah. to the room. Good evening. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Can I just ask you about China? Um, in the 1950s, there was a great concern in the US about Russia catching up with China. 
And in fact, the Russian economy did grow by 5% a year through the 1950s, and they managed to do um, mm -hmm. Gagarin's space trip and all this and create panic in the States. But basically what happened is after that, the, Ru the Russian economy stagnated because they just couldn't do any of the uh, difficult stuff. And I'm wondering whether we could get the same thing with China. And to illustrate what I mean by the, the hard stuff, just on the road from here this weekend, there's the biggest music festival in Europe. And it was started by a farmer in a field 50 years ago or something. That is inconceivable in Xi Jinping's China. And they just can't, they just may not be able to do the hard stuff. It depends what you mean, uh, hard stuff. But, but the interesting thing with China is its political system and how they can throw a massive, well, it's centrally planned. So you can, you can throw a lot of resources onto something if you want to do it. But, but, but yeah, exactly. But it's not done in an efficient manner. So far, it's been successful. But I think within the next 10, 15 years, uh, China at some point will have a financial crisis. You know, it's part of the natural sort of growing pains of, of, of any economy, really. They haven't had that since the 1990s, 80s. So that would be, I think it's, it's going to be quite interesting how they deal with that. You know, because if you look at, for example, uh, debt levels, private sector debt levels, and private is a loose term here, as a proportion of its GDP relative to income, it, it is an outlier by far. I think there's some stuff happening within the real estate, semi-governmental organization nexus that no one really understands. So you will have some sort of turbulence at some point. So it would be interesting to see how they deal with that as part of their growing journey. And if they don't deal with that well, then the story could well change. Yeah, good point. Well, I mean... Look, China has been quite good at tech and, and imposing tech into its society and business, etc. They have been better at it than, than most Western economies, partly because of that top-down imposition level. But you're right. I mean, you know, different economies are, are good at doing different things. You know, the Western economies, the UK is being heralded about creativity, all those things, which I think are less likely, partly because of the political system, but partly because of, of, of the competitive advantage of the country, to see that. So, you know, all of our projections sort of assume pro-growth policies are followed. It's a trend, so we can predict the ups and, ups and downs. But, yeah, interesting to see how they will develop. Good. We've got two more questions mm. in the room. So, Hi, thanks very much. That's really interesting. Uh, you had a chart there which looked at the growth in Nigeria, yeah. Yeah, Nigeria's growth in, in productivity, uh, sorry, in, in, in output. And a large chunk of that, you said initially, was coming from simple demographic, you know, population increase. You said you changed your mind about that, and that's so that shifting. The so those demographic projections come from the UN. The UN uh -huh. updates these projections, I think, every two three years. I think it's called UN Population Prospects Report, mm -hmm. which is which is the they've got scenarios as well around it, but we we pick the main scenario. Uh, the Economist had an article on this, but it, which talked about the shifts in in uh, in the, the projections between the latest ones and the, the ones before. I think Nigeria was the one that got heavily revised down in terms of its population. And is that applying to some of the other, to Indonesia, to... Brazil? No idea, I'm sorry, but but we are writing an article on it. That's all okay. I can tell okay. you, okay. Uh, <laughs> which should come out in about a month's time. Yeah, But it, it was quite interesting to see that. And out of all of sort of the major economies we've got there, the US has forecasts of, 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 of populations were the ones that were pretty much consistent with what we thought. Like China's uh, decrease in, in working population was much more aggressive than we thought as well. So the, the, those little nuances matter over a longer period of time. Mm. Okay. I think the latest UN projections are still around sort of 9.5 to 10 billion mm. people by 2050. Peak. So that's going to be the peak, supposedly. I think we've got one more question and one more from the lady here, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, you said that in the future, the income of advanced economies won't decline. And as other economies um, grow, does that mean at some point in the more distant future that every economy will be a high income economy? Depends on the diffusion of technology. Uh, but, you know, high income economies sort of are defined what, 30, 40K in terms of 
per capita incomes in PPP terms. So at some point they will exceed that threshold, but that relative difference I think will remain. They might, some, some will converge faster or, or, or slower, but that relative difference will remain just because the advanced economies are starting from a really high point already. It's a shame. I think we're a long way away from AI creating all the value in the world yeah. and we can have a universal income where everybody's happy and there's no more poverty. So I think that's a bit of a utopian dream by 2050, but maybe maybe in 2200, 2250, who knows? Final question for you. Um, yes, you said at one point about the role, you said at one point about the role that education played. Um, you mentioned Nigeria, and I heard something yesterday about the level of education. A lot of, a lot of kids are not getting educated yeah, in Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. So would that be a factor? And will that also apply I mean, China has got a, an amazing education system and the people work, yeah. the pupils work long hours. Yeah, and you can see it from the PISA scores as exactly. well. Exactly. Well, uh, right now, I think the, the variable that feeds into the model is years of secondary education or something along those lines, uh, which was from the Barrow Lee database, if I'm not mistaken. Now, for Nigeria, we assume that it would converge to a certain level by 2050. If that pace of convergence is faster, you would assume that you'd, you'd utilize your existing workforce in a much more efficient manner. But if, if, it, if it is what you're telling me, then probably that growth number that we've got there is overstated. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely would. Uh, because, you know, education augments your uh, existing workforce and how productive it is. Uh, if it doesn't necessarily mean that you know over the period of time you're always going to have a, an increase in the educational attainment of the population some countries do fall back well i mean that yeah yeah good point you could have asked about work ethics but this could take us a, a long long time and i think i think we'll delay that one to the talk on society mm. which is coming up because there will be something about how we're going to work play and exist in 2050. But listen, uh, that's been a real tour de force, Barrett. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent elucidation in terms of where we're going to be globally around uh, the economic and business world. Very much appreciate it. Please put your hands together at the back. Thank you. So just before you go, just a couple of announcements. So, so far you've seen the first talk, which was Hamish, giving an overview of 2050 as a whole. So we started the deep dive in the individual talks now, and there's going to be seven talks, well, six more talks, with Barrett today talking about the economy, the global economy. Next week, on Friday, we're going to change tack altogether. We're actually going to go into climate change and, and human health. And we're going to be welcoming Dr. Eunice Lowe from the University of Bristol, She's also a key contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. It actually reports as to where, where population levels will be, what the impact of climate change will be, and what impact it will have on human health. So that's next Friday, the 30th, here. So please put that in your diaries. And I won't go through all of them, you'd be pleased to know. The next one after that, because somebody mentioned it, I think it was this lady here at the front, we're going to have Victoria Ward here, actually beaming into the room uh, from London, I think. Uh, and she will give live, that is, and she will give a talk on the society in 2050. So societal changes, generational changes, attitude to work, attitude to leisure, attitude to each other, uh, the fragmentation that Barrett talked about and the polarization, populism, and everything else. So those are the next two talks, and I hope uh, you'll come and uh, see that because he will go deep dive into each of these different areas. And then I'll tell you about the next few talks after that. So all that remains me to say is thank you very much for turning up both online and in the room and have a safe journey home. See you next time.